good morning, Amy. Good morning, Ted. Hey. Hey. I am I am so excited to be here. For those of you that are not familiar, this is Amy Morgan, the San Antonio Marriage Initiative feature writer and the amazing Ted Lowe. I'm so excited to get to learn from y'all today. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah. Oh, hello, Marriage Champions. I'd like you to meet Ted Lowe. He is a speaker, blogger, and the director of the marriage ministry, Married People. Ted's 10 years preaching sermons on marriage became the foundation of his books, Married People, How Your Church Can Build Marriages at Last, and The Best Us, Marriage is Easier Than You Think. He writes for Married People blog and hosts a marriage and family-centered podcast. Ted graduated from Fuller Theological Seminary. He and his wife, Nancy, have been married since 1995 and have four children. Hey, Ted, thanks for being here. Hey, Amy, thanks for having me. Oh, well, hey, Ted, what have you seen during this time of COVID in marriages and how does that intersect with your ministry? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we live in Atlanta. I guess you guys get uh, in Texas too. understand the whole idea of tornado warnings and tornado watches. I've kind of been like the self-appointed like tornado watch warning for marriage ministry because we've invested into it for so long. And I was like, oh, man, this is going to matter to not only marriages. This time is going to matter to marriage ministries. Uh, and so I just I feel like I've just been kind of, kind of uh, keeping watch. But the news is really not uh, it's not all bad. In fact, the state of marriages right now, you got 58 percent of couples saying we're closer since the pandemic. Uh, at the same time, you've got 38 percent of couples who say that their marriage is experiencing more stress than before. And so I think what this really does, Amy, is it really highlights the thing that we that we know and we hear is that marriages don't stay still. They're either moving forwards or backwards. And I think what happens during times like this and what studies are showing current studies and past studies is that when things are really emotional like this, when things uh become scary that people start making decisions about their relationships. There was a study after Hurricane Hugo that um, they went into the areas that were hardest hit. And one of the things that they found was that there were more divorces after Hurricane Hugo, but there were also more babies and there were also more weddings. And they ended the study and I've got it right here. I just thought it's fascinating. It says the results suggest that a life threatening event motivated people to take significant action in their close relationships. Now watch this, that altered the course of their lives. And so what we've been saying as married people is when big things happen, big things happen relationally. And I started digging up a little bit to go, why is that? Why is it that when things like this happen, you know, because it happened after the great, Re great recession, you know, the divorce rate went down and it stayed down 20% since the great recession. Like what's, what's going on there? Uh, and I think Charles Duhig, Duhigg's um, book called The Power of Habit and his research kind of sh shine some light on that. Um, he says that our habits become flexible when things become emotional. Okay. So, you know, we have all these habits. A lot of our life, we all know we just do it out of habit, right? Yeah. The same is true with marriage, that we've got these marital habits. And some people have great habits and some people not so much. So what this time has done is it's made those habits flexible again. So for some, they use that flexibility to draw together and others, it's just heightened the struggles. So with churches, the way it intersects with married people is what I wanna to say to churches is, I wish we had the luxury of, of putting marriage ministry off to the side until everybody catches their breath. Right. And I think that's where marriage ministry can li live and to use the Stephen Covey term. It can marriage uh, ministry can live in this place where this is important, but it's not urgent. Where other ministries like children's ministry and student ministry and Sunday mornings live in this is important and urgent. And over the last few years, I've watched churches really take marriage ministry and say, yeah, this is important and urgent. My fear, my greatest fear, Amy, of this, and I try not to live out of fear, but I'm just going to be honest with you. My fear is that people are going to say, hey, this isn't an essential right now ministry. So we're either going to keep it in or move it back to this quadrant of this is important marriage ministry, but it's just not urgent. So what I'm saying to church leaders is we can't afford to miss our moment. I think that we've got to leverage the growth 
of these 58% of couples that are closer. And we've got to really dive in. And this may be the most important reason. We've got to dive in and help that 38% who's really struggling. And when you think about that in terms of your, you know, you're looking at your, your congregation on Sunday morning and you're seeing married couples and you're going one in three of them is hurting or you're out for dinner or um, you're out and about wherever you are and you look and you go one out of every three couples is hurting. So I'm saying, I feel like we've got to pour into those and leverage the growth. We've got to help those are hurting. And I think there's so much to be learned from both. I think they're both teaching us. And I just don't want our church to, churches to miss this moment. And so married people uh, came about in 2010 and we wanted to help churches help marriages. And so that's been our goal because we know that most churches don't have a, st a paid staff member. So we want to create a strategy and the resources to go behind it that a volunteer could implement. So now I just feel like more than ever that that's important to do. That was a really long answer to your question. <laughs> no, but that, that is exactly what I wanted you to do to tell us how then you, you I think you've made your case that there are couples and especially as people are starting to go back to church. Yeah. I mean, here, here where we are in our part of the, the world, but, but we're, you know, this could be a global audience, but we're yeah. starting to see congregations again. Yeah. And like you said, as you look at the congregation, there's people who are hurting and there's also people that have maybe created some new habits. They started taking walks together again. They started eating dinner together again. So, how can your, you, you've got your ministry, married people. How can you churches use that to help couples? Yeah, for us, one of the things we wanted to do is I was at a large church here in Atlanta. That's what I did before married people in 2010. I did nine years. I worked uh, as a director of married life at our church and it was a larger church. So we had all these other churches coming in going, hey, this is neat. This is great. But uh, what do you have to help us do it? Because we don't have this size staff and whatever. So that's where the kind of the dream of married people took off was, hey, let's create resources that we could hand to people. So when they asked the question, what do you have from our church that I wanted a really good answer? So we just try to, everything we do is digital. So we give them the, all the resources. So here's how you can do an event. Here's date nights and different things. Um, and we did it in a way where a couple, um, excuse me, churches could put their own branding on it. Like we tell churches, we don't care what you do with it. As long as you don't sell it, we don't care what you do with it. You put your name on, take ours off and watching how churches take it and make it so much better. And that's not false humility. That's like churches take it and make it so much better. They just take it to a whole different degree. We've got a, a Facebook page. It's a closed page, but we're easy to get into. But it's married people leaders. And you can see what all the churches have done. And a lot of them, Amy, are doing amazing date night pickup bags and things like we'll create kind of the journey for them but they're taking it to this whole new level they're putting it in takeout boxes and putting all this fun things around it the pickup stations are really cool so we're seeing churches just kind of use this moment um and right now they're interjecting a lot of fun which i love because i think people are so tired and they're just so emotionally exhausted so uh People are all, you know, fun is life giving. I know working on your marriage is important, but fun is life giving where working on it can take a lot of energy. So we just like to empower churches to be able to do what they do. You feel love on people and uh, hopefully these resources will help you do that. Well, I love that. Could you be, give us some specifics about what is in the marriage kit, what churches could, can expect if they connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a theme each year. This year, our theme is one things with the S in parentheses. And we say sometimes one thing can change everything. And we kind of came up, we didn't kind of, we did. We came up with this theme pre-COVID, right? And we we're thinking, let's just give couples just one thing. If they were only going to focus on one thing. So we did one thing so that there's multiple ways to do that. So we did that a couple of ways. We created resource to help churches have a couple of uh, one night events or even use it on Sunday morning. So it gives you the it gives you the graphics and the video message. And here's a host script. We wanted to make it as easy as possible. And then we have a new <coughs> small group study in there called One Things. And that's my favorite thing about it is I interviewed five different marriage experts. And I said, if you could only tell couples one thing, what would it be? Yeah. And their answers are amazing. And so uh, it's Jim Burns and Shanti Felhan and different ones. It's just so so good. Uh, their wisdom is so good. And then it's got the date nights, which I think we're going to give one of those away. Uh, date nights. And then we do a thing called Married People Monthly, where it's this e newsletter we send to you and then you customize it and send it out. Or a lot of churches just send it out like it is because, again, they're busy. But it's just these pieces 
that's all digital that people can take and customize and make it their own. Uh, it's just been so fun watching churches just kill it. And again, some churches will use 15% and then you've got other ones. They're just like, they're not changing nothing, which I'm like, you need to change some of it. But, um, but yeah, it's been fun watching churches during this time. Like, you know, going, we're still going to have a good time. I mean, that's why I love everybody going to that Facebook leaders page because it's mostly a good time to see what churches are doing. So hopefully that we, those resources that we found them to be very helpful for churches. But at the same time, if a church doesn't need it and they've got their own team and they're creative and they've got the bandwidth, go. You know, uh, we're just there for those churches who, who need a little help. And it feels like churches right now, even the larger churches are like, no, we need plug and play. So but it's, yeah. it's a lot more. Well, could you give us an example of a date night? Because that was one of the things, you know, you've talked, we've talked about it. Why is a date night so important? Yeah, you know, one of the most fascinating things, Amy, that I've ever read was actually a secular book. And it talked, it's called How to Improve Your Marriage Without Talking About It, which every man in America just went, sign me up. Uh, or my wife just said, sign me up. Uh, but what they say it was fascinating is that we have been led to believe that words lead to connection. That if we just talk about it in the right way, if we both have reflective listening and we both learn all these really complicated skills, that if we talk our way to connection and what they say is, is that connection leads to words that when we're connected, the words will come. It's it's the reason, you know, you're hanging, you go on vacation, you're not going there for the two of you. You're not going there for any agenda, but you end up talking about some pretty important things and you're kind of impressed with yourself that you're able to to talk about, right? You're like, whoa, where did that come from? Or you're driving down the road and you're talking and all of a sudden it's like, it doesn't get triggered and you're able to do this. And so what date nights do is they connect you and the words will come later. What I'll say with date night is for churches, I'd say this, our goal of date nights are to help couples to laugh and to affirm and that's it. Because date night has such a positive connotation with it. I don't want the church to do anything to it to take that positive connotation away. I just want you to make what they already think about it better than they ever dreamed. So don't. I, my suggestion is don't give them a lot of homework on that. Don't give them tough questions necessarily. Give them some fun. Set them up to affirm each other. Set them up to laugh. Set them up to be playful. And then the words will come later. But dating is so huge. All the studies are showing, you know, the couple that plays together stays together. It's just, we've got to have that time. And that's one of the greatest things churches can do. I mean, from here's a date night you can go and do, or even having a one night event at your church where it's full of a lot of laughter and they can bring their friends and, and those things that are a lot, a lot of fun. That's, and that's important right now. You know, that sounds very appealing, especially like you said, this been tough and you, everyone is emotionally exhausted and yeah. just the thought of doing something fun. I know you talked about the marriage people ministry that you have, but it, it also was kind of founded on, I got your book right here, uh, your married people book. Do you want to talk a little bit about how the book was foundational for the ministry or? Where yeah, it was really funny. I, we didn't really set out to do a book. I wanted to, I wanted the, our strategy to, of large groups, small groups, and helping individual couples. I wanted it to be so simple that it didn't need a book, to be honest. Like I wanted to be able to explain it really quickly. Here, a volunteer couple that has real lives, that have jobs and children, go do this. But what we found from church leaders is they wanted to know deeper. Like what are the whys behind what are you doing? So we just unpacked the strategy there and what we found. And we highlight some different churches that are using the strategy. And um, yeah, it, it's funny. There's not a lot of books on marriage ministry. There's just, there's just not. So I had a couple of friends who was like, you guys need to do, you need to do this. And so uh, I partnered with my friend and mentor, Doug Fields, and we put the strategy together. And so, yeah, released that. And um, it's been fun. I mean, somebody told me that they saw it in seminary and I wanted to like go really like somebody should have asked me first because i am not sure that this is seminary level work i'm like going if i knew this was it up in seminaries i've never written it but uh I, I guess it's all they can find but uh i think i think it's helpful and it's a it's a, it can be a fun read too but yeah that's what that's I, about. I love that though because i think that's important if a pastor it, it, it elevates the place of marriage ministry like you said if it's if it needs to be urgent, 
then the pastors in training need to learn about it. That's really yeah. important. Yeah. Well, and there's a whole section on there about it's step by step. Like you've got to get senior leader buy in because if your senior leader's not with you, forget it. So if you are a senior leader, we need you to be pro. But it's one of those things to say, hey, you come in with an answer and a solution and just say, Pastor, I need you to champion this. I've got this. I need you to cheerlead this, but I've got this. And so we tried to make it in such a way to do that. But it is hopefully step by step to kind of help people think, think it through and make it doable and sustainable. That's the thing with marriage ministry. A lot of times, you know, you'll have a, a children's pastor who will say, I'm going to do marriage ministry. And then they'll feel how they'll see how big it is. And they're like, Oh, one well, date night every five years. That's what I have capacity to do. So we're like, slow down and have a surplus of leadership around you so you can sustain, sustain the momentum. Yeah. I I think one date night every five years would be that that would be not not considered an epic success. I'm, I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to agree with you. You'd be surprised how that's the case. But I get it. I mean, church leaders are I get it. They are especially now things have gotten even more complicated for leaders. So I don't want to be one more guy that says you need to you have to at the same time. You need to you have to when it comes to marriage right now, they need us right now a lot. Well, and as we talked about your book, you also have written another book, and that's The Marriage is Easier Than You Think. And that has kind of a surprising title. You know, we're talking about, you know, digging into marriage, working on marriage, and yet with your positive attitude, I think it's reflective of, of who you are and what you found. So tell us some more about that. You know, it, again, I didn't set out, like I, I think I'd said for years, the world doesn't need another marriage book. There's a lot of great books out there. Um, but what I found was we, when we did events at our church, we do four to six events a year for like nine years. And our pastor really encouraged us to only tell couples one thing at each event. Only they can only walk away with one thing. Well, that really made us focus and hone in. And of course we want it to be biblically based. And then when I started looking, there's not a lot of verses on marriage in the Bible. There's really not. In fact, it may be the only time the author just punts. Paul goes, marriage is a mystery. Um, but there's only a few verses. And I thought, if marriage is a mystery, instead of trying to unravel the mystery or the complexity, which is what couples try to do, especially in counseling, they want to give you all the details so you can unravel the mystery. Instead, what would happen if we applied just a few things uh, the way God calls us to? What if we applied, we have what we call the core four habits, these four verses to a marriage that couples could start to make a habit. Uh, and again, we're back to this word habit that, you know, habits become flexible when things become emotional. So we were like, what if we help them to have these? Because I would find myself, Amy, over and over saying at these events, hey, this may not be easy to live out, but it is easy to understand. Because, and I'm gonna sound very charismatic right now, but I just believe it's true. Satan is the author of confusion. And if people are confused about anything, when you talk to them, it's marriage and they'll go, it's just so complicated. so confusing. I think Satan loves that because if you can keep us confused, you know, we can lose. I don't know if that's, that's, it keeps you confused. Then you lose. How you doing right there? Just, just happen. Just happen. But I think right now it's, you know, why would God make the gospel clear and marriage complicated? So I think he's given us some clear ways. They're not easy to live out, but they are easy to understand. And so that's what we say. Hey, here's some things we believe if you apply these. And we believe research shows if you apply these, it can really make a big difference. Uh, and that's encouraging. In fact, when they brought me the book, it was 100 pages. And I was like, this is all I know right here. And it's even big font. It's all I got. Uh, and all the millennials in our office, I was like, oh, gosh. They brought me the comic book. And I went like, oh, no. And they're like, don't make it any longer. And I was like. Yeah, because the millennial said it, I'm going to leave it because I don't know anything else. That's all the stuff I know right there. Uh, but I know it's been fun. Uh, we, it's a marriage book for people who hate marriage books. Uh, I don't know. We've, we've had a lot of fun with it. Lots of laughter with it. It starts with the, the habit of having serious fun. That's where we start. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's playful, but I think it matters. I mean, we've got a lot of research into it that's helped couples. So, yeah, it's been it's been a little bit of a ride, but it's been a fun one. Well, tell us what those four core habits are. You got me all interested now. Well, I'll go super quick. Have serious fun comes from Proverbs 5, a very serious verse where Solomon uh, is, I say, trying to scare the pants on his sons, saying, if you follow 
<laughs> if you follow this adulterous woman, if you follow in this way, if you focus sexually in this way, you're going to get to the end of this thing and you're going to really regret it. You're going to get to the end of your life and say, oh, how I hated instructions. So for I think it's 16 verse, he is just look out. Her feet are going to lead you straight to the grave. You know, it's kind of like parenting. Don't, don't, don't. And finally you go, well, what's the do? And he stops and he says, be captivated by the wife of your youth. And I thought, how powerful is that? It's not work on your marriage. Just enjoy your marriage. So we've said, hey, the best way to protect your marriage is to enjoy it because nobody's telling couples that, right? The best way to protect it. So that's where the date nights come in. That's where we enjoy each other. We celebrate each other instead of trying to figure out all our differences or figure resolve everything that we start to connect. Because right now there's we have so pushed the importance of communication in marriage. And it is we've so pushed it that people think if they have any issue that they have not talked through, that they, they have to put their marriage on pause. Yeah. I had a friend of ours who had gone on vacation, just the two of them. They said, we don't want to go. And I said, why? They said, well, we keep fighting about the same thing about whether to stay in our house or to sell it. And I'm like, we well, just don't talk about it on your vacation. And yeah. these very smart people look at me and go, can you do that? And what that said to me was they thought if we have an issue that we don't have anything else. So for us, again, it's like enjoy each other, delight in each other. And yes, this includes sex and intimacy and romance and all those things, but just really starting with that. So the second one is love God first, which I know feels like, wait a minute, why don't you put that first? I'm a, I'm a firm believer that humor opens the heart to deeper things. Um, and we say love God first. We really push, you know, it's Matthew saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind. Secondly, love others as yourself. And I love the order of that because when we spend time as an individual, right, it postures us to love our spouse in a way we can never love them on our own. Cause I feel like a lot of marriage advice will say as a couple, you need to go and do this. You need to go pray. You need to do devotionals. Great things. The problem with that, especially when you talk to audiences more than five couples at a time, you know that in those couples, there's going to be couples where one couple wants to work on it and the other one doesn't. So when you say as a couple, you need to, you've just unplugged all application for that, for that person. Yeah. But when we look at this thing with you go, you go connect with God, you love him first. When you connect with him first and then you come back around and love them, you're going to be postured. You're not going to be so needy of them. You're not going to try to get to make all their emotional needs. So I love the idea of people when it comes to God going, I'm going to be the best me by connecting to God, uh, respect and love. And I'll go fast. Uh, it's just this. We talked about respect and love. Uh, submit to one another. It starts with mutual submission. When you watch couples fight, they get out of this rhythm of respecting and loving each other, right? You can see where that breaks apart. Uh, and finally, the one is practice your promise. We spent $72 billion on weddings the year before COVID, $30,000 at wedding. So we say marriage is not about the big day. It's about the every day. And just to practice those things, we call them micro moves, but your marriage is made up of these little tiny moves with each other. So what do we promise? Well, we promise some big things for your poor sickness, and health for better, for worse. And to say in those moments, when we talk to each other, when we text each other, when we love each other, it's these moment by moment that we're practicing those big promises that we made. Uh, and I love watching that. I love watching people realize that marriage is not about the big conversations as much as, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind text. It's flirting. It's talking great about your spouse in front of your kids. Um, you know, it's just these small little things that we can do. And that's kind of a theme of my ministry, to be honest, has been like, don't feel overwhelmed. Don't freak out. I'm fully convinced if we would hand married couples a pack of post-it notes and say, I want this completely gone in 365 days full of affirmation uh, and, and gratitude. We would do, it would do wonders. So we just want to help couples to have those types of habits. And again, I don't think that's always easy to to live out, but I think it's easy to understand why it's important. Well, I know when we talked, you mentioned some of those just simple little habits like the post-it notes. In fact, you inspired me. My husband was going on a trip and I stuck a couple little post-it notes in his in his uh, toiletry bag. There you um, go. Yeah, and, and he liked that and it's good, but you had some some other little suggestions and some tiny little things that, that can really make a difference. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's the thing where, you know, we've all heard five love languages, whatever that is for your spouse, 
you know, you start speaking whatever it is speaks love to them. I think there's, you know, there's so much great neuroscience that's coming out about relationships. I think one little thing is if your spouse triggers you, just don't talk for a minute. Take a breath. I mean, your logical brain when your spouse triggers you goes out to lunch and you're triggered and you say things you don't want to. The next time your spouse triggers you, just pause. You know, it's James 1, 19 and 20. Quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. That's the thing is scripture will take this huge, complex thing called neuroscience and go. And in light of being triggered, what do you do? Quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. So it's those moments like that. It's doing a chore for that your spouse hates and they walk in. And all of a sudden, there's no clothes in the dryer. They may think they're robbed or you know, initially, but they will learn that it's from you. So, it's, you know, we ask uh, online, what are some things, small things that your spouse does that communicates big love? Coffee was involved a lot. Coffee. He brings me coffee. She brings me coffee. Dishwashers were a big thing, right? So I think it's, it's those small things. And I think that's encouraging, really. I think couples have not had a lot of relational wins. A lot of couples don't like they haven't had a win in a long time. And when we help them have wins, when we encourage them to make their spouse's coffee and bring it to them in the morning and they do it, their spouse is like, has a, re a good response. That's enough for me for the day. When I hear those kind of stories, I'm good. Right. It's, just, it's those little things that matter. Coffee is a really big deal. I've been married for 26 years and my husband brings me coffee every morning. He puts it right next to my, you know, he's up early and it's there when I wake up. So. Exactly. It, it, I, yes. It's those things. Oh, and, you know, and I, what I say to married couples is we have what single people are praying for, right? We have too many to do life with forever. And I just don't want to take that for granted. It's, it's an honor. It's a privilege that someone trusted us with their heart, right? Someone trusted us with their life. And if they're going to know grace and love and affirmation, it's going to be because we choose to give it to them. And so I think as church leaders, we need to, you know, in a loving, gentle, encouraging way to remind people going, hey, someone trusted you with their heart and their life. Give them, give them the best. Like, fast forward this thing. What do you want to say about you at the end of this thing? Right. And we want it to be good. They're just, they're just so great. I mean, that's the thing. We've, oh, we can make it feel so complicated. It's great when it's done well because we've done it poorly and we've done it well. When it's, when it's working. I mean, what in the world? I mean, we have teenagers and we were like, I looked at her that asked, "What can we imagine if we were trying to do this on our own? How do people do that? I have no idea. We can't do it with two of us." But I just think, oh my goodness, if I didn't have her. We've got about a minute left. Is there anything else that you want to say? Any takeaway, something that we forgot to ask? No, I just I just want my plea as somebody that's been standing on tornado watch for marriage ministry. My plea is let's don't miss this moment. We've got a moment. I know everybody is overwhelmed by so many things, but I think let's don't miss our moment. Let's don't miss our moment. Let's help those that are hurting. They need us so badly and they will divorce. They're, a lot of them are heading that way. Let's love them. Let's leverage those who have learned and let's, and let's learn from both. So I just think let's don't miss our moment. Lean into a volunteer. Maybe you are that volunteer. Take a breath. There's other people that want to help and just say, let's get strategic about this thing. What do we want it to look like a year from now? and start making steps in that way. They can do it because I watch volunteer led marriage ministries all over the country and they're crushing it. Some of them are the best because they understand the real world that sometimes us ministry folks forget. So they well, can do it, they can do it. Well, I love it. Thank you so much, Ted. This mm. has been so much fun. And if anyone needs some help connecting with Ted, you can always find us at Sammy, samarriage.org. So thank you again. It was really fun talking to you. And it was so great talking to you as well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.